So I'm 31 years old. I have my PhD in history. I would consider myself very successful in my career choice. And I'm pretty much happy about everything all the time. But I'm not married. I'm not engaged. I'm not even close. I'm not quite sure why it hasn't worked out for me yet. I'm fun. I'm charming. I'm not completely hideous. Uh, I'm not high maintenance. I've got a lot of pros in the minds of the male of our species, if you know what I'm saying. I think I'm a pretty decent catch. Where is your evidence of that? You're on stage giving a presentation about how lonely you are. If you were a good catch, by 31, you would be married and on your second or third child. People who are highly desirable don't do what you're doing. By the way, what exactly am I learning here? I thought this was Ted. We are supposed to hear ideas worth spreading. Instead, we got an 11-minute personals ad. Oh wait, this is TEDx, the B team of TED. There are a couple good TEDx talks, but TEDx is known for a lot of low-quality performances. I mean, TEDx is such a joke that there was this comedian named Sam Hyde who went to a serious talk about the future and just trolled the entire event with a bunch of TED cliches. Pat yourselves on the back right now, okay? Let's do it. Come on. That pat on the back right there is for saving the worlds. Okay, worlds. 2070 predictions. The next 50 years are going to be some serious stuff. Seafloor farming. 75% of the world's surface not being used by agriculture. On the seafloor, you're going to have sea beets, sea yams, sea cabbage. Have you ever had sea cheesy baked potatoes that blew your socks off? Can you control the slides? Get on the right slide. Yes, that was a real TED Talk. I think his point was well made. This is for Mr. Hyde. Um, obviously, your presentation made a big impact on all of us, but I'd like to know what messages that you'd like us to take away from that exactly. I don't know. It's nothing. It's just a bunch of crap. <laughs> so this TED Talk with Dr. Erica Morin is actually a video I've already talked about very briefly. The reason I never covered the full thing is because it's too similar to another video I have, and that video is currently my second most popular creation. I didn't have anything different to say, but now I do. And this is a pretty consistent problem, so it's useful to bring it up more than once. Let's get into it, but first, if you like the content you see on this channel, then consider making a donation. Viewer support helps keep me independent, and it helps fund a lot of the quality improvements that I make on this channel. Links to my PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar pages can all be found in the description. And also, don't forget to support me on Alt Tech. Links to my BitChute channel and my Minds page can be found in the description as well. Alright, let's jump right into the speech. Here's the part that everyone cares about. And in terms of what I want for a guy, well, when I was young, I created a long list of all the things that I wanted in my future husband. And there was all sorts of personal qualities and physical attributes and just general skills or uh, possessions that I thought would be useful. 36 requirements? Holy crap, it's like her future husband is a Build-A-Bear. Look at this. She expects a guy to be a computer expert, an auto mechanic, a plumber, and know how to build things. Erica, those are like four different complex skills. No person could be good at all of those skills as just like a side dish while also working a career that pays them well enough to have luxury items like a boat. Do you live in the real world? Have you met real people? Have you built any actual skill? Because if you were actually really good at something, you would know that the time investment required to know all these things is not possible. Maybe if he was like 60, he could know all that stuff, but I think that is a little out of her range. So she wants a guy who is six foot tall because she's 5'10". Well, that already crosses off 85% of the population. Nice. He has to have like 20 different trade skills. He has to have a degree or be educated. He has to have enough excess income to own and maintain a boat. So now we are talking about a six-figure salary, which eliminates 87% of the population. More if you factor in that he has to be six foot tall and earn six figures. And last, he has to be a Yankees fan. This is the kind of stuff that drives men insane. In fact, it even drives women insane. Here's a video from a matchmaker who says she refuses to take on female clients because their requirements are so ridiculous. I stopped matchmaking. 
And the reason I stopped matchmaking is because the average woman doesn't really want just a good man. She doesn't want a husband. What she's really wanting are these standards or ideas that she has of what a man is supposed to be. These match, I was matchmaking, I would be like, man, I would go find these incredible men. And they would be like, oh, mm, I would never date him. I'm like, I just went and found a freaking pilot of that ex-Falcons player. Are you serious? But he don't look, it's like, it's like he's gotta be perfect. But you're not perfect. Exactly. The matchmaker is right. I look at this list of 36 different things and think, what makes you so good that you deserve a superhero? And I'm sorry to say, you have friend zoned the, the, the men that really you're compatible with, the men that would make a wonderful husband. Well, at least in Dr. Erica's case, she shortened her list, which is actually a good decision, though a little late. Let's see her final version. Okay, so I don't care if it's superficial and shallow. I want somebody that's taller than me. I am five foot ten. I am not a small girl, all right? I don't want somebody that's going to make me feel any bigger than I already am. I want somebody that's smart. I'm smart. And I want somebody I can talk to. Uh, they don't have to have a PhD necessarily, but they can't be threatened by mine. Trust me, no guy is threatened by a PhD. If that's an issue, it's not because you are too smart for him, it's because you are entitled. Intelligence is a bonus as long as it doesn't come with a crappy personality. Also, if you look closely, you'll notice that physically attractive is at the top of the list. More proof that feminists don't believe their own claptrap. All the years of berating men for wanting women to be attractive, and even the feminists will say they don't want to date an unattractive man. And I assure you that this woman is super woke and the exact kind of feminist that I'm talking about. Here's a clip from a different TED Talk that she gave. But my research priorities are social history and cultural history and gender history. Gender history. We know what she means by that. There's more evidence of how woke she is, but in order to cite my sources, I would have to go onto her personal social media. While she did do a TED Talk, she's not a public figure or a content creator, so I would rather keep her personal accounts as private as possible. Anyway, looking at her revised list, we see five things, which I can actually cut down to three things. Smart, ambitious, and sense of humor could all be the same category if you just said money, because smart, ambitious, and funny are all markers of wealth, which is why women are attracted to them. So we have tall, rich, and woke. That's who she wants. I will say this, though. The one intelligent thing that she wants on that list is someone with similar values. Marrying someone with different values is incredibly stupid. You can partner with people who have different interests, but not different values, unless you want to fight constantly. But as I said before, what qualifies her to get the things that she wants? You don't just get things for free. If you want to be the kind of person who gets what they want, you have to work hard and earn it. Let's be realistic. You are 31 and you are almost completely past your prime, particularly if a guy wants multiple children. If we are talking about having enough time to date, get married, get a house, and then have children, we are looking at someone who is 33 to 35 years old. And that's if you found your soulmate tomorrow. At 35, we're getting pretty close to fertility problems. Outside of that, Erica has several indicators of poor mental health. The first one I picked up on was the little girl voice. When women experience heavy trauma in childhood, it will sometimes imprint on their voice. So if they had severe trauma at 7 years old, they will sound like a 7-year-old as an adult if they don't get treatment. Treatment will naturally deepen their voice over time if they do the right work, probably because relaxing deepens your voice, whereas being tense from, say, tons of unresolved issues will make your voice higher. I'm sure this happens to men too, but I don't really know how it manifests. It's just something I picked up listening to years of a radio call-in show called Loveline with Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew Pinsky. I don't know if anyone has researched this, but in terms of the show, I've listened to hundreds, if not well over a thousand women, call in with that voice. Almost all of them said they had a trauma history when they were questioned. Typically severe. Now, I haven't seen Erica specifically state that she has a trauma history, but she has quite a few markers of it, like being a super woke feminist and not being able to maintain a stable relationship at 31 years old, even though she says she wants one. The giant list is a subconscious way of avoiding a real relationship. Untreated trauma survivors see intimate relationships as a mechanism of being hurt because that's what their childhood was like. 
So they just move on from one toxic relationship to the next, and then they actively work to destroy any healthy, close relationships they have. They don't know they're doing this, and this is why raising children properly is important. Raising a child in a bad environment will ruin their ability to hold good relationships as an adult. Second, Erica is obese. Obesity is not just an issue of physical health. Obesity is a food addiction, so it also says something negative about your mental health. Here's something interesting, though. Dr. Erica says that a physically attractive male is a high priority, but she isn't even doing her best to keep herself physically attractive. Even worse, she says that she won't date an obese man. And I have tried that online dating. And I've met some really great guys on there. But overall, my experience has been horrible. And more than once, you know, a circa like five foot four, 300 pound dude hitting on me, which like, you know, looks aren't everything. And I applied your confidence, buddy. But really, really, come on. Again, do you see how wrong feminists are about human nature? She expects her partner to follow a standard that she won't even follow. And don't forget, she insulted her example by making fun of his height. He can't help that he's 5'4". He was born that way. Third, she's a cat lady. BuzzFeed came out with this list a few months ago in August, and it's 24 things single people are tired of hearing. Uh, don't worry, you'll find someone. Just don't turn into a crazy cat lady. Too late on that one. Using animals to make up for your lack of ability to create a healthy relationship is not a sign of good mental health. Last but certainly not least, Erica has no idea what men want, which means she doesn't care about her future partner. She only cares about what she wants. People who actually care about others take time to learn their preferences. The fact that she doesn't understand why she's been unable to find a good partner means that she hasn't spent time learning men's preferences, so she doesn't know what they want. She doesn't take the time to learn because she doesn't care. It's really simple. All you have to do to attract a good partner is provide them what they want. More evidence that she doesn't care about people is that she is a teacher and I don't even think she knows what her own audience wants. An audience that pays to learn from her. Everything to her is about her. The premise of this entire speech is, I'm so great, I'm so intelligent, I'm the best girlfriend ever because I like sports and I'm not high maintenance. Uh, I'm not high maintenance. Not high maintenance? You had a list of 36 different requirements for a guy to be marriage material. How is that not high maintenance? Anyway, the point is that the people in the audience are here to see a show. I did some Googling and I found out that a ticket to this event was $25. Would you pay $25 to hear some PhD do a live personals ad? This was marketed to college students. College students are generally broke. If I spent $25 on this event making the kind of money I made in college, I would be pissed. I wonder how many students they had to bribe with extra credit to get them to go. If I'm going to pay $25, I want to learn something. The only thing I learned from this speech was how to not pester Erica about her dating life. I think I'm realistic and I'm out there trying. So I have a few words of advice for everybody that wants to butt their noses in and give me some information to help this poor, tragic, single girl. When you feel that word vomit bubbling up, when you feel that, well, are you seeing someone? Just consider this list first, okay? So here we go. Number one, don't ask me about my love life. I have to follow your personal list of rules before I talk to you, but remember, you aren't high maintenance. Even the other TED Talk she did was very socially unaware. All she did was talk about how cool her history lessons are. Great, I don't care. Knowing how new age and amazing your history lessons are is not going to improve my daily life. To be fair, though, I will say that her presentation skills are good, but if you aren't teaching anything useful, then it doesn't matter how good you are at presenting. As for the high-maintenance list thing, I can assure you that even if she got all 36 things she wanted, she would hate the guy. This is something I said in the other video about lists that I think is worth repeating. Having a Build-A-Bear husband leaves no room for discovery. It would be extremely boring. People like mystery. In terms of content creation, there is a reason why I never tell people what I'm working on. It's because people like to be surprised. Think about it this way. Let's say one of Erica's requirements is that she will only date a guy who likes pop music because that's what she likes. How shallow is that? 
There are tons of different styles of music out there, and you might find a guy who shows you something new that becomes your favorite style of music. If you are actively avoiding new information like this, you aren't really working to be your best self. It's like you're saying that you already know everything that's good, which is very arrogant. I hope she doesn't consider herself as an open-minded person, because having an extensive list on your perfect match happens to be very close-minded. Worse, she finishes her speech with the stink of death. It's okay that I'm not married yet. I'm independent, I'm intelligent, I'm accomplished. I'm just missing one piece of my puzzle, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna fall into place. But if anybody liked what they saw or heard here today. <laughs> Gross, don't do that. Don't do that with anything. No one likes a desperate person in any avenue. As for Dr. Erica, this speech was done seven years ago, so some time has passed. Did she find her soulmate? I don't know. However, I do know that she has a child, but I don't see any evidence that she has a husband, so interpret that how you like. And again, to help protect her privacy, I'm not going to show or link any of my sources for this information. Speaking of feminism being toxic to healthy relationships, here's the real damage that modern feminism has done. Modern feminism is a propaganda campaign that has been going on for decades. What it's done is make men weak and make women entitled. Women don't like weak men, and men don't like women who always have to talk about how great they are like Erica does in her speech. In terms of propaganda, people who want to do evil things know that most of our existence relies on information that other humans have figured out. The easiest example is language. Shortly after you were born, you were gifted the ability to take your thoughts and communicate them to other people. By the time you become an adult, you can do that with extreme accuracy. No other animal has that ability to the extent that humans have, and our ability to communicate is what led to all this great stuff. Communication is the most important ability that humans have. Language is something that probably took tens of thousands of years to develop, and you would never be able to create your own language that is as complex as modern language is. But because people have already figured it out, you just get to have it. With that in mind, there are other important gifts that you have been given, one of them being culture. What culture allows us to do is take all the positive and negative ideas that people have discovered over the course of history and use them for our benefit. A good culture gives us ideas of what works and what doesn't. So if you were, say, really evil and wanted to ruin the lives of millions of people, all you would have to do is remove the gift of good culture. Remember, it took millions of humans suffering for thousands of years to figure the stuff out that we know today. You would never be able to originate all the good ideas in your culture by yourself. What the absence of good culture turns into is a bunch of people like Erica running around not knowing how to get what they want. There are certain things that compel people to like you, and feminism and modernism has stripped vast amounts of people of that information. What propagandists do is flip all the information around. They realize that words are far more powerful than violence, whether you are using them for good or evil. Nonviolence is the most powerful tool for authoritarians because it allows them to attack us without us knowing that we are being attacked so we don't fight back and they can achieve victory without getting hurt. But also note that nonviolence is the most powerful tool for good. If you want things to get better, you need to be using the most effective tools. So the way authoritarians or propagandists attack you is they get you at a young age before you have developed any values so you have no defenses, they remove the working values, and they replace them with values that don't work. They also make the bad values sound very desirable. Propagandists can't just tell you to do bad things. They have to show you how awesome those bad things are. Who is the cool kid on TV? The drug-addicted loser who has a series of toxic relationships. Cultural propaganda is why things are constantly getting worse as time goes on, and it has to be stopped. Considering the level of technology that we have, if we don't stop it, the people responsible for it could lock us into a situation that is so terrible that it would destroy everything or take thousands of years to remove it. We can't afford to lose this battle. But the good news is that there are far more of us than there are of them. When you have vast amounts of people, you have a much higher chance of figuring out a strategy that the authoritarians can't predict. Certainly, a lot of stuff hasn't gone their way in the past few years. Now that far more people are aware of the problem, we have the advantage, even if things look really bad right now. So do you hate things like family courts, a problem that can technically affect both sexes but pretty much exclusively affects men? 
Well, the only way to change that is to fix the culture. I've talked before about artificial birth and artificial relationship partners as a way of circumventing family court, but now that some time has passed, I realize that won't solve the problem entirely. Certainly, access to a family without dealing with the horrendous court system is very important, but the problem is far bigger than family court. Family court is not the only major issue we face. It's only a single piece. In a society, you of course have to take care of internal affairs, but you also have to worry about outside forces who will try to conquer and dominate you. Artificial birth and AI partners do not address the vast amount of losers that are being created by cultural propaganda. So you can create your perfect life with your AI partner and artificially born child, but you'll have a bunch of disenfranchised people out there who will work to ruin your life. Losers and disenfranchised people get jealous when other people do well, and that jealousy can turn them into a tool for the authoritarians. I say cultural change is a higher priority because it solves the marriage problem and it solves the disenfranchisement problem. Let me be clear though. I'm not saying that men should take one for the team and plunge themselves into the horrible deal that is a marriage contract. I would never recommend that unless the culture and the laws change into something that's healthy. However, I will say that if marriage is a decision that you are already going to make anyway, despite the consequences, then choose wisely. If we want people to thrive and remove authoritarianism, we can't allow propagandists to disenfranchise people. Certainly people like me who have microphones can do their thing to build awareness of the values that work, but none of this does anything unless you take action. I can speak to lots of people, but I can't go into your individual communities and make them better. You have to do that. If you want things to get better, you have to start acting better. It comes down to the individual. All changes start with yourself. Fix your problems so that you don't become miserable and start taking it out on other people like the abusers and radicals do. You can create one less abuser in society right now by taking care of your mental health and learning how to communicate properly. Once you've built yourself up, help others do the same. If you have the power to, give people opportunities. People need jobs. You can create a company and give people a place to work. That is a tremendous gift. If you don't have that ability, how about you work as hard as you can at your job to make sure it's profitable so they can afford to hire other people. Or you could help a coworker get promoted. You could let a friend or family member sleep on your couch while they save up for a new place. You can mentor people and teach them useful skills. Go out of your way to help people who need it and facilitate their growth. Because if local communities don't work together and build each other up, the authoritarians will take all of those disenfranchised people who need help and promise them help in exchange for power. They'll say, oh, you need something? Let us do this really evil thing and we will give you what you want. By the way, I'll let you in on a little secret. The authoritarians don't actually help the people who need help. They just enable those people and make their problems worse. But bad people can't promise false help to regular people if those regular people aren't needy. Nor can they convince you to do evil for the sake of survival if you aren't needy. Don't allow them to compromise your morals because you made the mistake of not caring for yourself. Work towards success, help other people, and you will be immune to all of this nonsense. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share. If you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. You can find all of those links in the description. Last, if you haven't checked me out on BitChute, Minds, or Parlor, you can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.